Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Our debaters have taken the stage. Once again, I thank you for your politeness. We will be throwing questions to either microphones, as the rule is. Please make sure that your question is concise. Please do not begin telling us a story. And I understand, for this kind of topic, that you have many pertinent and powerful personal experiences, but we have a limited amount of time. I also have to tell you that anyone who goes to the microphone gets one question initially. Afterwards, they may go to the back of the line and wait for another question again. But even though someone may have six wonderful questions, we want to absolutely make sure that there is as much audience interaction as possible. Now, this will be a 45 minute period, although we'll see how long Bailey Hall really lets us be here. I will throw the first question over no. to Bob's microphone. Bob, you may fire when ready. This is a question for Alex. Um, you said you can't judge an ideology by those who depart from it, and you gave the example of uh, witch burning, but, um, and so presumably you don't burn witches, but considering that Exodus 22, 18 says that you shall not suffer a witch to, uh, to live, does that mean that we should judge you by how you've departed from that ideology? No, because that's not part of Christian ideology under the New Testament. That's, that doesn't apply. And we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, in fact, love our enemy, and that's what we do as Christians. So, those Christians obviously departed from any kind of ideology. This is a question for both of you. Okay. Is there anything that I could that someone could say to you, that someone could show you through a study, something sociological, something historical, that would cause you to change your mind? Can you tell me what those things would Both of them. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, it would just have to be, uh, because the question you'd have to think about is whether religion is good for society or not. I wouldn't, no evidence showing that religion is good for society would necessarily make, think, make me think that the religion is true. So just to get that point out of the way, all it would take is you know, sociological data, psychological data, suggesting that participation in a religion and involving yourself in a religion consistently caused the people you know, following it to be better off in terms of their own personal well-being, and that societies in which that was the dominant view were better off. Uh, but that would be very hard to establish, uh, because you'd have to take out all of the confounding variables, things like what I mentioned uh, during the discussion, things like whether it was the social network that the religion offered that made your life better, things like that. If you could control for all of those variables and show that specifically the belief in the religion or something unique about that religion itself made your life better, then yeah, I would agree that that religion was good for society. The question is whether I would change my mind about whether a religion is good for society or not, or change my mind about my faith. No. It's, it, look, this is a debate about a question, not about your faith. So we could have two Catholics up there arguing that one is religion is bad, one is religion is good. What's the null hypothesis? What would lead you to change your position? What proof do you need to see that would cause you to change your position? I think I'm well beyond that. Honestly, I'm well beyond I, I've, been, I've been going to churches for 25 years. I've walked into church after church after church where hundreds and hundreds of people have told me that their life became so much better and improved. I've seen it in my family members, my, you know, my, my, my uh, friends, you know, that were drug addicts and, and criminals, and so it goes on. Even if God came down here and told you, if God came, if down, God came down here and told you, well, listen, I'm God, your religion is wrong, okay? You wouldn't believe him? Your religion is bad for society. Because you were defending Christianity. Right. There are a lot of religions, right? I mean, you want to talk in hypotheticals, I guess I would have I'm sorry, sir, we are going to have to leave the, the, the next answer is no, I've, I've, I, yeah, it's hard to change my mind at this point. Hi there. Uh, I'm a son, a child of a Holocaust survivor. My mother spent a year and a half, it's unfortunately, survived. Uh, my big, I, have, I have four questions, so I'm going to keep going around, but uh, I'd like to know, uh, you mentioned earlier, well, you disassociate yourself 
from the Inquisition, you disassociate yourself from the pogroms, they happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and therefore Christianity and, uh, it has come a long way since then. My question deals with a matter of time and perspective. Uh, 1940 wasn't that long ago. Uh, where was a moral law during the Holocaust period of time in all the Christian countries? I'm not talking about Hitler, I'm not talking about Stalin, but where all the good Christians participated in the Holocaust. They were the soldiers, they were the, the gas chamber people, they were the, the guards, they were the ones that separated people from one another, they were the ones who, who turned on their neighbor. Where were they? How can you tell me that Christianity was, was, is, is not that way anymore, when in recent history it was? Well, as far as I know, Hitler was not a Christian, although he did. He did. Audience, let us remind although ourselves that we are did, the debaters. Although he did make positive statements to the church because he needed his support. But, you know, read men come. I mean, he is a product of evolution mixed with the philosophy of Nietzsche. That's not my question. My question said, ignore Hitler. Look at all the good millions and millions and millions and millions of Germans, Poles, French, all those people and all the other Christian countries who participated in the slaughter of 20 million people. How can you say that Christianity is good and that you disassociate yourself from that? I can understand you saying 500 years ago, but this is 60 years well, ago. Well, let me say this. 70 million died out under Mao Zedong. 40 million, I, I know that, but all I'm trying to say is Christianity is not exclusive to these atrocities. Atheism is part of it as well. You have to understand that my, the goal of what I was, my point was that there's moral improvement with Christianity, not that people become perfect. In the case of, 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 of Stalin, a, an avowed atheist killed 40 million, executed 40 million. And, 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 and destroy churches, closed down 55,000 churches and killed the clergy under the French Revolution. Again, these were atheists. They couldn't kill people fast enough, so they had to create a machine just to cut their heads off fast enough, called the guillotine. So it, I'm just saying it happens under all ideologies, including atheism. Let us throw over to the next question at the next one. All right, uh, Alex, just I was wondering, um, where your happiness studies come because of cross reference in EU studies on social value science and technology and human development say that of the 25 happiest European countries in this decade, 80% of 80% uh, of those countries, at least 50% of their populations state in the survey that they do not believe in God. So just saying that. But with your question or your statements about Mao, about Stalin, etc. Um, we're, we're talking as atheists, as Gnostics, etc., about a secular moral system, and that is not, that's different from, say, Denmark, Sweden, etc., where voluntarily, and atheism yeah, and communism are Sir? very. Sir, Sir? 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 if you could agree with that, are they. Are you are atheism, is, do you think that atheism and communism are the exact same thing? No, no, I think, I think communism is a um, totalitarian system, but I think that uh, you kind of need atheists to get to the place where Stalin was, where it was imposed on everyone. But, but what is your, I don't understand your question. What is your question? My question no, I don't think atheism and communism is the same thing. Is okay, that it? but no. you're, you're, you're lumping in, when Stalin sent a seminary, um, you're lumping in societies where secularism was forced on people and it wasn't in the name, it wasn't in the name of the state. It wasn't in the name of atheism. An atheist state, I might add. Well, well you lump the church's atrocities together, we're lumping the atheist state together. How is that any different? Okay. Let us okay, go. and one more thing about, about atheist societies that are happier. I have, I still have family in atheist Cuba where they don't allow religion. They're not that happy. Neither are they in North Korea, if you just watch the news. So I don't know, where are these atheist nations? Norway, Finland, etc. But anyway, we'll talk about that at the next debate.
Next question. Lance, uh, you know, we're here on a debate tonight on, on is religion good for society? Under your worldview, what's the basis of determining what is good in society? Well, what I mentioned is that it's well-being. And that's a, a tricky, difficult term. Uh, I don't think that we have all the answers to exactly what constitutes well-being. But when I speak of well-being, what I'm referring to is a particular set of mental states where and we all have experiences, obviously. And we have experiences that some of them we approve of. We go, I like that experience. I'm a horror. And we have experiences that we think are bad, that we, we don't have. And when I refer to well-being, I'm not talking about specific things out in the world. Often people will say, oh, well, if you're for well-being, then if chocolate is, is a tasty flavor, then everybody should have to eat chocolate. And they'll make these assumptions that, you know, you're for this mass uniformity in society. And I'm not saying anything like that at all. What I'm saying is simply that there are facts to be known, and there are matters of psychology, of neuroscience, of cognitive science, about what things in the world, what sorts of stimuli, what sorts of phenomena, produce in people mental states that they want to have. And the more we learn about these facts, the more we learn about how we can better structure our societies to increase that. Uh, I mean, for instance, we're studying depression. We're finding out the causes of depression, both neurologically, behaviorally, and the more we know about that, the more we can address issues of depression, the more we can address issues like suicide, and that's really what matter, using the tools of reason and science to find out what promotes the mental states we want to have and push for more of that. So you're not really, so you're not really, see I thought the, the topic was, is religion good for society? But if I hear or understand your answer, what you're saying is we can determine internally what makes each person happy th through through science and, and, and studies, is, is that? Yes, what I'm saying is that, see, this, this system that I'm advocating, uh, I mean, I would, favor particular philosophical instantiations of it. I might say consequentialism is a good way to go. I don't know what the best ethical theory is, but it ought to be a secular one because religion-based ethics just don't deliver the goods. I mean, for one thing, I mean, how does a book like the Bible handle moral complexity? How does it handle modern issues like uh, internet access rights? Something like that. How, what can you possibly extract from the Bible that could help you with that? Now, someone could. Uh, sir? Yeah, one question. Hold on, sir? Sir, uh, at the length of this response, I am sorry, we are going to move to the next slide. We can't get everyone in unless you have one question. I'm moderator, not commenting. Next question. This is Matt Alex. Uh, would you agree that the more dogmatic an institution is, and the more it concentrates its power, in unelected officials, the more likely it's to be abusive. And so that would be the reason why you would put churches, which are so dogmatic, in the same category as you would the uh, North Korea and the other countries, but you wouldn't have in that category the countries like Finland. Do you have a question? Yes. I'm asking if you agree, namely the more dogmatic, and the more that you concentrate power in single individuals, or a few individuals, the more likely you're going to have abuses. And so that yeah, but here's the, here's the problem. It's number one, I don't think power is concentrated in the church. Um, but here's, what, here's, here's another problem with your argument, is that you're right, Christianity is dogmatic, but on theology, you know, there's, there's lots of areas that are open for discussions. It's why we have many denominations. But when it comes to theology and moral value, where it counts. See, here's the problem with this argument that logic could take us somewhere good. Is that reason is based on an, your underlying assumption. In other words, I can easily, if I do not value life at all, logically make an argument for euthanizing all people. They cost too much. They're not happy. They don't have a good quality of life. Um, you know, No one can take care of them well. See, you can make that argument. But if you really, really value life, you can make the same logical argument that says, hey, they're important, we love them, they have the right to life, whatever. And but so you, reason is based on your underlying assumptions, and that's the problem with logic. And that's where the dogmatic religion comes in that says, 
life matters. We are created by God. He loves us. You should not kill. You should not commit adultery. You should... See, that's where religion should come in. Thank you. Next question. Uh, uh, Alex, thanks for coming out tonight, by the way. I'm an atheist, and it uh, seems to be a lot of negativity uh, about atheism here. My question to you would be, if atheism is defined as a lack of belief in a creator, would that not make God an atheist, since he would not be a, have a, a belief in a creator? Uh, no, I, I, I think God <laughs> believes in a creator, he just happens to be the creator. Okay, next question. This question's for Lance. Uh, first, I'd like to comment on the fact that you did say that what is good for society is what is good for the individual. Every individual, you did mention that the good of the individual. Uh, I, I didn't say that as far as I know, but I don't think that that's... That was my understanding, but we'll continue from there. Having said that, I'm going to say that the individual makes up the society, therefore what's good for the individuals in that society is what is good for the society. I'll make that statement then. Having said that, based on what you've said so far tonight that I've listened to, and my understanding of the atheism, which would include this, and I think you agree on it, from the beginning of time, all men have had certain questions in their heart as expressed by the Greeks, for instance, Aristotle, up to the philosophers of the day. Those questions are, why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? To which the atheist, I think you'll agree, answers to, where did I come from? It was a freak accident, something in space, an explosion, which followed to evolution. So you came from slime. Why am I here? Sir, it's this slime. is a succinct question. This is the question. So, I can say that. succinct. Okay. So the college student who's here, who believes you, right now, who thinks that he is here for no meaning, no purpose, no value, that he will die at the grave, along with all mankind in the death of our son, who is thinking of committing suicide when he gets home because he can't take it anymore, what would you have to say to him as a suicide hotline person? That's a good question. Uh, first of all, I don't think anybody has ever called a suicide hotline because they put down a textbook on evolution and said, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. Does that ever happen? Yeah. Uh, people don't have serious existential crises over being atheists. So they were. Why are there so many of them here? Why have we all killed ourselves? Uh, I mean, what I would say to that person is that they're a complete idiot. <laughs> I mean, what, what would you want me to tell them? Uh, I mean, value doesn't come from some external source like God or something like that. It comes from what we want, what we desire. So what I would tell them is I go, okay, so there's no God? All right, what do you care about? And if this person cares about nothing, then they probably do have a legitimate mental illness, and maybe I'll try to help them out. Um, but they are probably more like me. They care about their, their friends, their family, uh, the environment, charitable causes. People have all kinds of values and they're derived from the real world, they're anchored in the real world, and they're not from some magic sky fairy. We will move to the next question. <laughs> question here, Alex, please. Uh, Alex, uh, in your opinion, is it good for a society to endorse a sacred text? I'm referring to the Bible, second most popular book in Germany under Nazi Hitler, uh, both the New Testament and the Old Testament. I don't understand if you rejected the Old Testament or not. But anyway, any rate, is it good uh, for a society to endorse a sacred text that celebrates or condones the hatred as expressed by genocide, murder, torture, rape, and slavery, all of which are in your Christian Bible? I, I would say it is uh, good to embrace sacred text because Christianity brings us a lot of good things. I, I, what is your question? Is it good to endorse to... Give me specific. What is your question? Yes, I am is it, good to endorse, is it good to endorse the Christian Bible, which, if you read it, and I'm sure you do, endorses and celebrates genocide, murder of firstborn, drowning of babies, drowning of pregnant women, torture, murder, slavery, rape, on and on and on. I could take, I could take a half an hour. You know what the Bible says. Yeah, the Old Testament and the New yeah, no, it doesn't say that in the New Testament there's a new covenant with God. And, and it's too big a question to try to answer now. Let me, let me summarize those right now in that 
The Bible does not endorse genocide. Yes, there is condemnation by God, and God allows people to be killed in the Bible. There's no question about that. But it's always for judgment, for evil acts, always. And even the children of God, this is how we know it's not genocide, because even the, Israel, the Israeli people were condemned by that same God they loved, okay, and were put under slavery, under under um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So we know that judgment came not only to the people of God, but always for the cause of sin. Moving to the next question. <laughs> Moving to the next question. Uh, Highlands, um, one main point that I saw you were making, you were talking about morality. It was morality throughout the whole debate. You were talking about good, bad, right, wrong, justice, human rights, values, social obligations. So my question is, is what's your measuring stick? How do you know if something is morally wrong or morally right? Because I don't think you can get that from evolution or atheism. Oh, well, I never said you would get it from atheism or evolution. Uh, what you would get it from is what I was telling someone earlier, uh, which is that what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the good is, again, experiences that we want to have. I don't know of anything else in the universe that would matter. I mean, imagine a universe where there were no conscious beings, where people didn't have experiences. That would not be a very interesting universe. It wouldn't be a universe in which anything could matter. In order for something, in order for morality to be instantiated, there have to be beings that are capable of having experiences. And what I believe that morality comes down to, or at least ought to come down to, is a question over what sort of experiences we want to have, what our desires and values are, and which sorts of ones that we don't want to have. Uh, what metric would you use for that? Well. There's a lot of different metrics you could use. There's self-reported happiness. We could use fMRI to scan people's brains. Uh, we could measure life expectancy. Uh, there's all sorts of objective metrics that would sort of indirectly get at what promoted the human good. I mean, presumably, people want to have long lives. Presumably, people want to have strong family connections. You could survey people. Do you have a strong family connection? Uh, you could look at the levels of depression. There's all sorts of measurements to see what sorts of things promoted people's happiness and well-being, and what sorts of things tended to make them worse? Thank you. So I, I think I think his question, though, he's he's he, uh, Lance is saying happiness and well-being. But what if happiness to me is um, I don't know killing killing dogs for fun? How do you measure that that's wrong and right? I, here's a here's a real simple question, but a simple way: How is adultery wrong? Is adultery wrong? And there's a lot of single ladies here, so you better be real careful how you answer that. Mm. Is adultery wrong? And how do you know? How do you get to adultery is wrong scientifically or through logic? If what you're trying, what you're saying is if it pleases me and brings me happiness, then it's right. Well, but but so many things have been justified out of selfish, self-centered gratitude. What I'm talking about is the collective well-being of a society as a whole. So you can imagine two different societies. One in which adultery is discouraged, it's people are following the heuristic, adultery is wrong. And then another society in which they don't have this heuristic. And then you can ask yourself, which one would be better? Now, we may not know the answer to this. Uh, one thing I want to reiterate about uh, all of this is that I'm for discovering these answers, trying our best to find them out. I don't think that we know all the answers, we may never get all the answers. What we have to do is do our best. And uh, to the question of adultery, I would believe that most instances of adultery would be bad because uh, there's always that risk that if discovered, there will be a sort of breakdown in the relationship between two people. We see this time and again. Is this really a complicated thing to wonder whether adultery causes problems in families? Not really. This isn't a terribly complicated thing. We don't need a divine mandate to tell us that uh, if you go behind someone's back, you can hurt their feelings. I mean, that's a much simpler, easier, and strong explanation. Um, hello, I have a question directed towards both of you uh, regarding the suffering couplets, um, specifically to both of the positions that you stand on. Lance, you mentioned how um, atheism or secularism uh, promoted animal rights, human rights, equality, things of that nature. Uh, my question specifically to that um, foundation is in the areas of science where like um, legal uh, testing and research is done to life animals, experimentation, abuse, and sla 
faith myth, what I really may call it, is done in the name of science and research. Is that good for society and how is that good for society when majority of um, majority shows that people who practice um, such uh, abuse towards animal or animals are more likely to become abusive towards each other? And for Alex, the question... Miss, um, if you're going to ask a question at Lance, you are going to have to wait for the question at Alex. I'm sorry. Lance. All right, so if I understand the question, you're, you're telling me that there's evidence to suggest that people who perform experiments on animals are more likely to become abusive in their personal relationships or something. Uh, if that's the case, then yeah, that might be a legitimate reason to restrict some forms of animal experimentation. But what I can say about animal experimentation is, first of all, uh, an excellent person to look into is uh, Peter Singer, who's been an advocate of animal rights for many years now. He wrote a book, Animal Liberation. And he argues that many instances of animal experimentation are probably not morally justified. I have a lot of problems with people doing experiments on animals that I think may have greater moral status, like chimpanzees, monkeys. I think a lot of these experiments may not be fruitful and should probably be restricted. Other experiments, though, may give us enormous benefits. Uh, for instance, one study I know of, uh, they performed on rats, is they would sever their spines and then inject them with stem cells to see if they could get restore limb function. Now, if this comes at the loss of a couple hundred mice, but the long-term benefits are the permanent ability to restore quadriplegics, paraplegics, to physical functionality, not only among people, but among other animals, if that ever became available, the net result of this is enormous, enormously beneficial. And the question would be, is that sacrifice worth it? In that case, I think yes. And I think that's a difficult question. In many cases, I would go to the side of, yeah, we should do experiments on animals, and others I would say not. Right. It's, it's close to home. As an astrophysics teacher who had to teach a group of eighth graders about the last fate of Laika, the space dog. So, moving to the next microphone. I guess first I have two things for Alex. Uh, uh, Please choose your best question for Alex, sir. One. All right, well, it, it seems to me that you've at least uh, made the claim and perhaps made a case that Christianity and Christians have historically progressed over the years. Um, and I, I, I tend to agree, to agree with that. But you've also relied on an argument saying something along the lines of we need moral absolutes as a society. They're good for us. Christianity is a good source for uh, absolute moral values. But it seems to me progress of the kind you've been talking about, where we go from burning witches to giving to charity, uh, can only happen when Christian scriptures are not treated as absolute, when they're subject to the kind of scrutiny and inquiry that science and ethics and philosophy has to offer. Uh, so, question being, am I wrong <laughs> in seeing that? And is there anything uh, in treating doctrine as an absolute that somehow is retrogressive or prevents progress in your opinion? Alex, before you answer that, I'm going to say, if we could cease all cell phone conversations in Bailey Hall, we would appreciate if you could cease all cell phone conversations during the question and answer session. I'm sorry. Summarize the last part of the question. Is there something that I see within Christianity that is too dogmatic, or is, was that the question? Summarize the last part of it. I understand your, 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 your assumption, but tell me. It seems to me that if we had done as you say and treated Christianity as absolute and dogmatic, then no progress would ever have been made. I don't see that, but go on. Oh, well, I mean, uh, if, if we treat a certain principle or a certain text as absolute or infallible, uh, and then a certain teaching, therefore, as absolute and infallible, uh, we're In... not going to ask any questions about it, and then we're not, therefore we're not going to change what we do with respect to it. I think what he's saying is, is, is it metaphorical or is it literal? Oh, I, I think there's all kinds of different writing styles within the Bible. Uh, they're not all literal. Jesus spoke in parables. We know that. He said, I'm the light of the world. We don't believe he was 110 watt gold. So there's, there's all kinds of different um, uh, styles, and uh, I think you've got to look at each one individually. You know, but originally it was said that which version of the Bible would you read, which would you not? When it comes to this conversation in terms of society and the moral values within Christianity, there's very little debate here, okay? Marriage is important, adultery is always wrong, lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, 
are, are there questions about uh, free will and, and predestination in some of these vague areas? Of course there is. But in terms of the moral ethics that the Bible has put forth, I think there's very little debate on there among you know a wide array of denominations. Thank you. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, no. No. <laughs> okay. So the answer is yes. I think when it comes to the ethics and the morals of the Bible, I think we are to be dogmatic about that, and uh, I think though there's clarity on that. And uh, I think there's other areas that are open for more than one interpretation in some cases, and, um, and, 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 and different interpretations over time. There's no question. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. Uh, my question relates to uh, the Bible and Christianity, particularly the Old Testament of the Bible. And uh, I would dispute something you said about non-believers before uh, and, and genocide, but my question is, what does the Bible say, specifically the Old Testament, about what should happen to homosexuals and what should happen to non-believers? What did God direct uh, Joshua and the other people taking over uh, the land of Israel? Uh, what did God say to do? And what did he say should happen? What, what did the Bible say about what should happen to homosexuals and for non-believers. I don't know anything specific to homosexuals other than it is sin and it's wrong. I, as far as Joshua, Joshua conquered land. God said to Joshua, you are to go in there and conquer that land because these are evil people. It was human sacrifices, rape, murder going on. And he said, go and judge them. So give me a scripture verse. Give me a scripture verse. Well, <laughs> me, I have tell, read the Bible tell me. many, many times shocked that you don't know them yourself. And I can I quote them chapter and verse up and what are you suggesting the Bible says happens to gays? Yet. I'm not <laughs> done yet. Oh, yeah, please. You are done yet. You are done. Well uh, you just tell me I'll believe what you say. What does the Bible say to I can you know, say I don't have a chapter or verse. I'm just shocked that you don't know them and what it says in the Bible because I've read it many, many times. Tell me that. <laughs> Tell me. Sir, Tell I think me. Alex has given his opinion as to homosexuality in the Bible. Whether or not. It does not say that in the Bible. Sir? You know, there was three reasons for capital punishment only in the Bible, and homosexuality was not one of them. Uh, actually, as far as I know, there's capital punishment prescribed for uh, the violating any one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, also, Definitely. the story of. So, well, it says that. <laughs> yes, uh, the story of Jephthah actually involves God accepting a child sacrifice in the Old Testament. So, it's not just that Christian or Jewish people were wiping out people committing child sacrifice. Jewish people were committing at least one child sacrifice. Uh, also, one comment on uh, declaring homosexuality sin. That's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about that I think is destructive to society. To say that homosexuals are sinning is, to me, nothing short of bigotry. It's as bad as racism. So, next question. Oh, Alex, I just want to say you look like you were yielding the floor to me. I'm just here to make sure you get the time. Don't don't worry about you interrupting me. I'm here to make sure that you get the mic. So don't stop yourself for me. I'm just here to make sure you get the time. Ready? Next one. Uh, don't worry, I won't ask anything about the Old Testament. Uh, <laughs> I, my question is actually for Lance. Um, you had mentioned uh, during one of your first sections that, uh, and I think correctly, that many of the Enlightenment thinkers were attempting to extract kind of a secular kernel from the Judeo-Christian system, uh, an ethical kernel, if you will. And um, I was just wondering, since there seems to be a consensus among philosophers, modern philosophers, that Immanuel Kant, kind of the quintessential Enlightenment thinker, failed in his attempt to create a completely secular ethics, known as, as his categorical imperative. What makes you think that you or the New Atheist Movement can, can, can succeed where Kant failed? Well, that's an excellent question, actually. Yeah, I, I would totally agree that I think Kant did pretty much fail, but, I mean, philosophy is, is progressive. It's a long line of people responding to other people, and, you know, a lot of the knowledge is built up on what Kant proposed. I mean, we see with uh, John Rawls in the 20th century, political philosophy sort of research in response to that. 
So answers to the original questions build on that and track for that. Do I think that we'll get to a final answer that will be to everyone's agreement? I don't know. Uh, so do I think we could do it? I hope so. Maybe we can't. I don't know the answer to that. Can I say something about that? In the last question. Here's, here's my question to you, Lance. Um, you said that Christians are bigots uh, regarding homosexuality. But in your ethical system, if we can show that homosexuality does not lead to happiness that you aspire to, would you say at that point it's wrong? Uh, well, the question, first of all, and I will answer it, is kind of a trap. I mean, he could just as readily say, if we showed that love made our lives worse, would you oppose love as immoral? And I would have to say yes to that. But it doesn't, I mean, so what? Uh, yeah, if homosexuality were bad for the world, well, then I would maybe. oppose it, but it's not. Well, maybe you don't know that they do have higher levels of depression, drug use, promiscuity, STDs. This is a fact. Maybe this is not my opinion. This is a fact. This is a fact. So at this point now, would you suggest that? Uh, well, well, first of all, if you agree or disagree, remember we are here to hear the argument. First of all, I would question whether that's even true, but if it is true, I would want to know why. And I think that the answer to that question will ultimately end up being that the discrimination and the stigmatization for being homosexual is what drives them to the dregs of society. <laughs> And I think we'll go to the next question. That's tremendous faith that you have in that statement, by the way. Um, you already have the answer, even though you don't agree with the problem, but go on. Okay, I have a question for Lance, but I would like to make a comment for those that haven't read the Bible. The Bible says that the penalty for sin is death. So for whoever is asking what God says about sin, I can tell you that the penalty for sin is death. And I believe that if each one of us has a different concept of Christianity, I am not in agreement with uh, ch like churches and religion. I right now have to say that I'm not, even though it's a, well, I'm making a lot of words. Sorry. <laughs> Question. So, but the point is this: I only know one Jesus Christ who died for the sins of the world. It's the only thing that I know. Uh, and my question is: Is man good 100%? Is is man 100% good to rest or live in his reason? for the source of our knowledge and the interpretation of evidence. I said, I asked these questions because I have been experienced of as like a lawyer. The thing is this, I have seen the practice of the reasons to, and the evidence, to use the reasons and evidence for transpeaking the truth. I don't know how to explain, I'm sorry. I hope you got the answer. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, so the question Lance, is this. I think what she's asking, and, and let me see if I can get it. Are you asking whether man is 100% accurate in the way he interprets evidence? Yes, that could be, or good in itself. You know, because if we are searching for an, an, uh, another way that would lead to moral, and that would lead to, to good behavior, good well-being, uh, what I understand is that your, your giving your support, your support to charity is that we could get another one uh, leading in reason and uh, evidence, right? That yeah. would, that would be the case. I'm really not sure I understand. Yeah. Um, do you 100%, do you say that man is 100% good in his ability to use and interpret evidence correctly? Take it from the position of someone who's oh, using her experience as a lawyer and who said that she's seen miscarriages of justice. Uh, we don't we don't need to be lawyers to recognize that. I mean, there's enormous amounts of cognitive biases. Humans are very flawed machines when it comes to applying reason and evidence, and it requires a lot of uh, oversight, a lot of understanding what goes wrong with our reasoning processes. Uh, so no, I don't think that we have a fully developed epistemology, and uh, I think that's one of the things that we need to develop to help us get at uh, promoting what the good would be. Next question. question is this one. It's reason. It's well, let's, reason. let's move on. Let's, we got to get on moving on to the next question. Yes. I'm sorry, Miss, we are at less than the 10 minute mark. Don't be, don't be. You feel strongly and we're happy you're here. I'm going to paraphrase a 2,500 year old question. Um, the debate was supposed to be, in my mind, is religion good for society? And so my question to you is, 
and this, again, I'm, I think I'm paraphrasing Plato here, but I'm, I'm going to try and do this, is an action, is a moral behavior, um, is a behavior moral, is an action good, um, is a behavior good because God says that it's good, or your religion says that it's good, or is that social policy, that behavior, that, 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 that moral conclusion good because the actions it involves itself are intrinsically good? The problem with that is who defines intrinsically good in this society? Because as I mentioned earlier, Satai, you know, wife burning, that was a normal societal reality in India. It burned the wife. So for the theist, if you believe there's a God, you believe that you can ask that God, if God is murder, right or wrong, and he would know the answer. So that's why we believe in a transcendent moral law, a transcend time and space. Lying, killing, murdering has always been wrong. It is, I don't know if you had a question or if that answers your question, but yes, I, I believe, why do we need God? I think what he's asking was, is there a platonic form of good or does it come from the religion itself? The, the problem is that if you don't, if, you, if it's not transcendent over time, and you simply said, okay, it's society that determines right and wrong, I mean, think about that. If today we decided to, America decided to kill by, via vote, we voted to kill every immigrant in America, would it be wrong? Would it be right at that point? Well, of course it would not be right. Because, again, for the Christian, we, it's not a cultural thing, this uh, idea of morality. It's transcended over time. Okay? Sorry. I have a question for Alex. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Steve. I'm an atheist. Hey, Steve. How you doing? You said something when you opened the debate about um, Christians have an incentive to be good, and that incentive is God is watching is that oh, really being good? Because I better be good, God's watching me. If I'm good, I'll go to heaven. If I'm bad, I'll send me to hell. That's not being good. That's being covering your ass. Excuse me. I mean, to me, being good is doing the right thing, to do the right thing, not because someone's watching you. So, is there a the problem? I got the question. No, the, the problem is, is that we're generally not good. You know, uh, 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 Lance said, well, is it right to, to motivate by fear? Well, Every law in America motivates by fear. We need fear to motivate. But my point is not whether that's a good idea or not, because I can argue more profoundly that the Christian heart has changed when he asked Jesus into his heart. That heart is transformed, as the Bible promises. But nevertheless, when we're talking about society, I was simply saying that there is an incentive. Whether you want to call it fear or not, it's not, it, it, it's not relevant. The point is that Christians have an incentive to be good, and that when one becomes a Christian, generally speaking, obviously not in Germany, generally speaking, they become better morally. And that's the point that I was making. And again, all you have to do is walk into any church anywhere in America, and you'll see that as a reality. Uh, I hope you don't mind me interjecting in that, but you reminded me of an excellent quote I actually had with me regarding moral incentives. So this was uh, by Bakunin. He said, freedom, morality, and the human dignity of the individual consist precisely in this, that he does good not because he is forced to do so, but because he freely conceives it, wants it, and loves it. Uh, the, the Greeks advocated this idea of, you know, virtue is its own reward, and there's actually a lot of studies showing that when people participate in charitable causes and do good things, that it actually makes them happier. And I think that that's a much more sound basis for motivating morality, to give people internal reasons for wanting to do good, rather than threatening Ready? Lance, this is for you. So, first a quick question. You just have to answer yes or no. Do you believe in all cases that religion is not good for society? Uh, no. I think no, there might be some mean. instances in which, in very localized circumstances, religion may be better than non religion. I don't know if that's actually the case or not, but I think it may be. Like in the case when uh, maybe somebody would be a, a murderer or a drug addict and they turn to religion as right. See, it might something promote, to save them. And that's why I disagreed with that distinction earlier on whether something is good for the individuals that it's good for society as a whole. Because something that's good for individuals isn't necessarily good for the whole. There's actually uh, a recent article I read on how if you added extra lanes, and this sounds unrelated, but it 
it's related. If you add extra lanes to separate highways to allow people to cross between them, that it seems paradoxical, but it can actually uh, slow down traffic to give extra lanes. Uh, you'd have to get into like statistics to explain why, but you get this sort of tragedy of the commons effect. With when each individual, what's good for them may not be good for society as a whole. So, in order for some individuals to benefit from religion, you would have to have this ethos in which religion was generally an accepted thing, and the net effect of that might be that for every one person that benefits from it, you get seven or eight people who go crazy and blow someone up. So, just because it's good for some people doesn't mean it's good for society as a whole. Sir, I know that was supposed to be the quick question, but I think we got a very substantial answer. Alex, did you want yeah, to add to this answer? To this answer. Lance is difficult to debate because he has this utopian kind of idea of atheism, which hasn't actually been tried, and he doesn't commit to anything. He just says, well, if we study it and logic takes us there, then we will find out. So he's not the typical atheist who would say, hey, we know that the universe had a beginning, as the Big Bang teaches us, and we know it was not God. He won't be, he'll say, I, I don't know. Well, most atheists will take a stance on that position, so he's, he's tough. And on that note, unfortunately, I'm sorry for everyone who is still in line. That is the end of our 45-minute question session. We only have the time that they give us. So, I could wait for all night, but the reason I'm on the microphone is to make sure that we had as much audience participation. And I know that only 18 of you got to the microphone, but I hope that everyone was made greater by the questions and the courage of their answers. I would like to... Mr. Kuzco. I just have one thing to say. Anybody that was here for extra credit, you can go ahead and leave. <laughs> there you go. Right, I'll take care of you. You don't have to. No problem. Well, first of all, all of our organizations would like to give thanks to Broward College for providing Baby Hall, and especially to the Baby Hall staff. And I saw them like. They were running around here like Lumpa Lumpa, getting everything built and everything done here. I cannot fault them for any singular thing. This was an amazing show they put on. Let's have a round of applause for David and Elsa. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank our sponsors, Calvary Chapel of Fort Lauderdale, the Center for Inquiry, and the Florida Atheist and Secular Humanist. There will be a DVD available. Please continue to check the organization 